one of my relatives actually took Beyond Meat public. Hmm. And so I was in the ground floor of being able to invest in the IPO. And, you know, I made some money. I had problems that I didn't even know I had until they went away. I don't mean to be crass, but when COVID first hit and we had these news stories that were showing this family, this family lost six people. And I looked at my wife one day and I said, is it just me or are almost every one of these young people they're highlighting really overweight? Everybody's concerned about the environment. Well, if you want to really do something the environment for the environment, take up a carnivore way of eating and watch how much less trash you have in your trash can every week. Joining us today, we have Brad with us, who's going to share, I guess, his, I guess, his story, his success. I, I hear you go by the the name of the carnivore curmudgeon, which is a bit of a self-deprecating name. But Brad, where are you located right now? What part of the world are you in? I am in the beautiful state of North Carolina. North Carolina. I got a lot of trees out there, a lot of furniture made out that that part of the world. I, I, how far are you from Hickory, North Carolina? Just out of curiosity. About an hour and a half. When I this is a uh, this is not germane to what we're talking, but I have to bring it up. Because when I was in the military, I used to launch nuclear bombs. It was part of my when I was in the Air Force, and we had to if we went to war with Russia or whatever, and we're shooting nuclear bombs at each other. Some guys got to do it, and I was one of those guys. Usually did it with two people. There was two people that you had to have. They're called crew partners, and the guy I was paired up with was from Hickory, North Carolina, and he had a very slow way of speaking. Right. He was very lazy with his voice. And when you're in there and they give you like you get the launch codes and we're doing drills and it's, you've got this sort of checklist. You just go through very quickly. Check, check, check. Done. Go, go. And he talks so damn slow. And we were under the clock and I remember, Neil, damn it. Speed up. <laughs> he was like, I'm from Hickory, North Carolina. He talked like that. Right. Anyway, Neil George, if you're out there, hopefully life is good. I remember his he had some moonshine sent from his uncle or something like that one time we were out there i didn't try any though but anyway uh, i'm sure not everybody from north carolina is, does that but it was this funny story it just reminded me of that so tell me i guess just tell me about your general background what do you do and tell us about your life and that type of stuff all right originally i'm from the midwest i grew up in michigan with but with a southern family who had transferred there typical northwest upbringing very corn fed lots of cereal Lots of soybeans, soup beans, potatoes, beer, just the normal norm for a, a Midwestern upbringing and worked and lived on a farm with my grandparents for part of that upbringing. Left there to go in the Navy and spent three years on the USS Nimitz when it was an East Coast carrier. And there's not really a whole lot to tell about that. I had a pretty, I had a pretty good naval experience. I worked in an air conditioned shop on electronics. And so I didn't have the uh, dangers of the flight deck and things like that. And then after the Navy, got married and managed somehow during my naval time to gain about 40 pounds. And then when I got out, gained another 10. And so I've always struggled with being that Midwestern pudgy guy, but being married, having a kid, trying to have a career, being overweight, I really got to the point where I just felt like I needed to do something. I tried, gosh, everything. I tried the the zone diet, I think it was called. I tried Weight Watchers. I tried, I can't remember that doctor's name. I think it's Furman. Um, Joel uh, Furman. Yeah, his he's, book and tried, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, he, let me interrupt there because Joel Furman had proclaimed on a podcast that I should be thrown in jail for advocating uh, a meat-based diet, which is interesting. So anyway. <laughs> I think I remember that. Yeah. 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 So he's not. Um, even- really, really, if, if it had the word the and diet with something in between, I probably tried it and just always seemed to have moderate success. And, but it was all about, it was all about my weight more than anything. I even tried not that long ago, figuring the information that I was getting that this plant-based thing must be, that must be the way to go. That's what mm-hmm. I'm missing. I've never tried that. And a funny side story, one of my relatives actually took Beyond Meat public. Hmm. And so I was in the ground floor of being able to invest in the IPO and, and I made some money. Uh, I was going to say, Beyond tell me you shorted Meat. that or something. <laughs> so, no, no, I actually, I, I made money on it. And then I decided it was baloney. I cashed out 
And just so you know, I took some of that profit and I invested in Rivero. Thank you. So awesome. That, that, that's a good cause. <laughs> that, that's good. That's a good start here. It's at the Beyond Meat invested in our company indirectly. Good for that. Good they, for they good did. for you. In my forties, I was diagnosed pre-diabetic and I had high blood pressure, high cholesterol, all of those things that so many of us are familiar with. And really, I was just handed a prescription for a bunch of pills and a pamphlet for how to eat according to the Diabetes Association. And, but during this time, struggling with this all this time, I also have been in the funeral business for 17 years, the cemetery, the funeral, the cremation business. And I've seen a lot of things. And I noticed a pattern throughout my career of how many very sick people were in our care. And, you know, that, of course, that's axiomatic in, in many cases. But when I say that, what I noticed was, why are these people so obese? Why are there so many obese people? Why are there so many obese elderly people and younger people? When I see people with purple caps that are big around as watermelons and sores, and it really made an impact on me that I didn't want to be like that. I didn't want to get old and have that kind of poor health. Maybe one day I'll write a book called Stay Off My Embalming Table. <laughs> but high stress, long hours, late nights, bad diet. I just really decided that I have to do something. And somehow, and I honestly can't remember, I worked my way around to the uh, keto way of, of eating and had some success noticed that I was spending a lot of time replicating recipes from the way I used to eat that wasn't good for me in the first place. Mm -hmm. Lots of things, you know, well, if you just do that, then you get this. And so my results really waned over time. And then I figured that out and I started moving more towards low carb and then eventually worked my way into understanding the, the carnivore way of eating, which was the game changer. In fact, in my early, very early stages of eating a carnivore diet, I was diagnosed with a couple of bad kidney markers in a row. And I really didn't know anything about it except for the nephrologist wasn't able to see me for seven weeks. In that time, I actually went on a carnivore diet. I lost about 18 pounds. I went in to see the the kidney doctor. And he said, why are you here? Your markers look fine. And I did not tell him what I did. He gave me his best advice, which was to watch some sort of film documentary about eating a vegetarian diet and riding bicycles. I really don't even understand what he was talking about. I just left there knowing my kidney markers were good and what I've been doing worked and continued to work. Gosh, I had problems that I didn't even know I had until they went away. I had a chronic cough. I had a constant sniffly nose. I had eczema, I had a hot patch in the back of my head that would pop up about every year and just drive me insane for three months. And that, that went away and has never returned. I had, I don't mean to be TMI, but I had hemorrhoids that were healed. Gosh, edema in my legs, GERD, dry skin, low energy. All of this just went away in the course of maybe six or eight weeks. And again, like I said, some of it, I didn't even realize I had a problem until it was gone. And then I realized, wow, I haven't had to blow my nose eight times today. I haven't had to use the bathroom four times today. So all of it just worked great. I ended up at, at my best from my heaviest, I lost about 55 pounds and I felt terrific. And my doctor, I went to the doctor. She asked me what I'd been doing. I said, I don't want to tell you because you're going to tell me to stop. And she said, just tell me what you've been doing. And I told her and uh, she said, if, to her credit, if it's been working, keep going. She still wanted me to take the statin. And I did for a period of time. I don't anymore. All of that was fantastic. I was just on such a great roll. And then <clears throat> that day happened. And that day for me, I wish I could tell you that I was 
running into the smoke and flames to rescue a, a wheel bound, a wheelchair bound granny with her six kittens or chasing down a, a purse snatcher. But I was bending over to put some pajamas into a drawer and I felt something ping in my back. And within 48 hours, I was in the absolute worst pain of my life. Just I've never experienced anything like it. It, it was a sciatic nerve pinch from a bulge disc. And I have in my lifetime, I have broken this arm up above the elbow. I've broken this wrist. I've broke. I can't even tell you how many fingers. I know both thumbs, several toes. I've had knee surgery on both knees. I broke my pelvic bone. I bought, broke my cossacks. I would do all of that at once over again to never have to experience that sciatic pain that I had. I was just literally crawling on the floor, crying like a baby. And at that point, instead of having the fortitude to continue with what I had been doing that had worked for me so well, I said, I want all the comfort. I want the, give me the drugs. You have drugs for me to take to, to ease this pain. I will take them. Give me the alcohol. Give me the food that will put me to sleep. And I spiraled really pretty bad out of control for, for several months, really. I did have surgery on the, the disc and it was successful. I think there's some damage done. There's times when I still can't really feel my right leg the way I should be able to, but, but my recovery was pretty good. And, and then eventually I got to the point where I just had to regroup. I had to recognize and say, look, this worked for me before. It sure isn't going to hurt me. It can only help me. And I got back on track mostly. It's like the carnivore curmudgeon thing you mentioned before. I always tell people I am a real carnivore. I'm not a real curmudgeon mostly. And as a carnivore, I've had my many successes, but I've also had my failures. And regrouping and really focusing on the, the practical side of eating a carnivore diet is really the practical side of everything has always been something that has helped me. And so that's what I, I've done the last year, especially. I've focused on health rather than the scales. I, I've recognized the importance of being metabolically healthy rather than just what does that scale say? Yeah, the scale is a tool, but there's a lot of things that go into that. Obviously, there's two people who weigh 200 pounds. It'd be very different from a health perspective for sure. So I'm just going to back up on a couple of things. So you said you'd had elevated markers of kidney dysfunction, probably elevated creatinine, I'd imagine, or something like that, or low GFR is typically what they look at. And nephrologists, you went carnivore the first time, and the nephrologist said, there's nothing here. Mission because you said you were on a ketogenic diet for a while. And a lot of people will say carnivore diet is just another version of a ketogenic diet. And, and a lot of people will tell me, why not just eat why just eat meat? Why not just eat like a healthy balanced diet and not eat junk food? I assume you'd we're, we're doing that anyway. When you go from keto to carnivore, the things you cut out tend to be vegetables, maybe some of the, maybe some of the keto foods, the processed foods, that combination Artificial of that. Artificial sugar, sweeteners and things like that. Yeah. Artificial sugars and stuff like that, for sure. Yeah. And so how much did you, do you realize, do you remember how much you put on after you, you hurt your back, you had that horrible lumbar radiculopathy, sciatic pain, which I, I can relate. I had a similar injury with a neck injury a while back and it was pretty, yeah. pretty miserable for about two months. I remember that. And I, and I generally do not take anything. And I think there was about two days where I took like an ibuprofen and some Tylenol. I was just like, I was pretty freaking miserable. But fortunately, that's all I needed to do. And I didn't, and I kept my diet pretty much as it's been for the last eight years. I switched to a little more higher fat approach in, in, in that situation, which seemed to have been helpful. How much, so you spiraled out of control for, you spiraled for a little while for three, four months or whatever it was. Four months, yeah. Did, did all of your other previous symptoms come back? The, the things you'd saw before? Did it make Almost, did, almost yeah. all of them. The, the hot patch I talked about, that's just never come back. But as far as that chronic little cough, the sniffly nose, the gas, the, um, the hemorrhoid, virtually all of it came back to one degree or another. Absolutely. Yeah. The nice thing, not that it's nice to experience those things, but the nice thing about that is that almost unequivocally, they they are diet triggered because he's like, when I'm on the diet, everything's good. When I go off the diet, the same things come back and you do that multiple times. I think it's pretty easy to demonstrate that. You know, these things aren't necessarily good for you. And especially um, if I can interject that the alcohol, 
when you've when you're 60 years old and you've been drinking for 45 years, it's easy to slip right back into that. And I think in the carnivore community, the keto community, I think the discussion about alcohol for the longest time was really wink, wink, nod, nod, leave it alone. We don't want to talk about that good time stuff. But I I think it's been changing in recent months. And I'm I'm really happy to see that. And I will say that was the carnivore diet was a key element in me being able to not drink because I was satiated. I, I would eat. I would make sure I would eat at a certain time and I would make sure that I ate enough. And then those cravings were just so much less, if not uh, nil altogether. Yeah, this is a topic I've seen come up repeatedly with a lot of people who have struggled with various addictions, whether it's smoking or alcoholism or recreational drugs and things like that. Many people will report that my my cravings for those things goes away by going carnivore, which I think is interesting. And we're seeing that. It's interesting because there's all these, these sort of new drugs out on the market, these GLP-1 receptor agonists that they're noticing the same thing. They're seeing these people when they have the satiety centers stimulated that it also seems to diminish the cravings for things like cigarettes and alcohol and other drugs. And so it's an interesting the way that physiology seems to work. Now, of course, I'm more obviously I'm more of a proponent of having that through a natural diet and eating rather than taking a drug, because to me, it's exercise makes my heart rate go up, but I can take a drug to make my heart rate go up, too. But (laughs) would I rather take the drug or exercise, which is going to give me ultimately the better benefit? And I think it's the the former rather than the latter. You, it's interesting you said that you're seeing all these people and you've been in the, the the mortuary mortuary business for 17 sure. years or something like that. Have you seen a change in your, I guess, clients, obviously deceased individuals? Has it has there been a visible change in the last 17 years that you've noticed, or has it just been always? Because we've been we've had a lot of obesity for for many years now since probably the 80s, so maybe that hasn't changed that much. But any change in the age of the patients, comorbidities? I don't know. I don't know how much you get into that stuff. We we see death certificates for every person. But a lot of the experience that I have was just observing. And I think the simple answer to your question is no, I haven't really seen a a big difference. I did see a difference during COVID, which in our area really, it wasn't as dramatic as I've heard of other areas, but there was definitely comorbidities with cases that had COVID, especially in young people. We, We saw a number of young people. And I I don't mean to be crass, but when COVID first hit and we had these commercials that were showing or or news stories that were showing this family lost six people. And I looked at my wife one day and I said, is it just me or are almost every one of these young people they're highlighting really overweight? Mm. And uh, it's one of those polite society things you don't say too loud or in front of the wrong people. But but I absolutely not only noticed it on television, but started to seeing it, started to see it in my profession as well. It's different when somebody is 90 years old and passes away with COVID, or if somebody is very ill and also gets COVID and passes away. But these young people, especially these really obese young people, I I just can't help but think of, would they be here today? Yeah, no, I would say most likely they would be if they weren't obese. And this is the one for us, I had many frustrations around this whole way we handled this pandemic. And one of them was that we just totally disregarded mitigating those comorbidities, which is very easy to, in my view, in my experience, it's easy to take a diabetic that's got wildly out of control blood glucose and normalize it. And it's not that hard to get people to lose weight in many cases. And yeah, even if it's 10 pounds. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, You you just reminded me of something in North Carolina, there are about 80,000 state employees in some way, shape or form. Last month, or maybe two months ago, they came out with a report that 23,000 of those 80,000 people have been prescribed Ozempic or uh, Wagovi. Is that mm-hmm. the other one? Yeah. yeah. Uh, 23,000 out of 80,000, most of them for weight loss, not for diabetes control. Mm-hmm. And so to your point, imagine if one third of those people just went on a low carb diet for 30 days. What they want to see the quick results with the shot or the pill, but they would be amazed, I think, 
at what they could accomplish health wise if they would just give it 30 days. Yeah. And probably a significant percentage of those people will lose weight. There's no doubt about that. But what is a long term outcome? If they go off the medicine, they will almost undoubtedly regain all or most of it, perhaps even more. And so the thing is, what they're proposing is we just need to be on this stuff for, for the rest of our life. Just like saying, well, it's just like a high blood pressure pill you take for the rest of your life. And I, and I would argue you probably don't need to be on high blood pressure pills the rest of your life. You'd fix your damn lifestyle. That's the same thing. But we're just being conditioned that this is a drug. This is a disease like anything else. It's like heart, it's like diabetes or hypertension, obesity. You just take pills the rest of your life. You take shots the rest of your life. And oh, by the way, they're $1,000 a month. And, and what they're going to try to do is get the government to pay for it, which means right. our tax dollars, basically. We're just going to be taxed for other people to eat junk and shoot up, shoot up well, these drugs. Well, to North Carolina's credit, the legislatures came out and said, we're not going to budget 20 plus million dollars for this. If you're mm-hmm. taking it for weight loss, you're on your own. Yeah, that, that's a con. That, that's obviously the, there's a lot of discussion around that. And I think that... There is, I think a lot of discussion needs to be had around. I, I would much prefer people. Hell, you could feed people steaks for cheaper than that. Literally, you could afford to buy people everybody's steak every day, less than $1,000 a month in these damn shots. But that's, that's all. There's a lot of work that needs to be done for that'll happen, which I'm working on, by the way. You, alcohol, you did, this is an important topic because I do think, I remember when, I think there was a paleo diet and a keto diet was talking about the acceptable. We got these special margaritas in North Cal. Rob Wolf was brought talking about his North Cal, North California margarita mix. It was low carb. And, and it's turning out at least a recent analysis has came out showing that there is really zero benefit to alcohol. I know there's people talking about that moderate alcohol is cardioprotective and longevity, but they reanalyze everything and they say, really, there's no benefit. There's no benefit to drinking alcohol. And the less you drink, the better. And I'm of that mind. I don't, I generally, with rare exception, I might have two glasses of year. I think this is 2023. In 2023, I think my total alcohol consumption here has been three glasses of wine. I think something like that. So it's so infrequent to be essentially negatively zero. And, and I, I never struggled with alcoholism or anything like that, although my dad did. And, and so I know there's some people who claim there's a genetic component to that. But yeah, the diet does seem to help with that quite a bit. Did you, obviously you said you were embarrassed to tell your doctor that you're eating basically a bunch of meat, which to me is shameful that we have to like be embarrassed that we're eating a bunch of meat. It's crazy to me, but some people, that's what the perception is. Did you have... When you decide to do this, I mean, you didn't mention family, wife, kids, or anything like that. Any family affected by what you're doing or notice or supportive, unsupportive, what's going on? In that yeah, sense, my wife was on board with it right from the beginning. And in fact, I would say in many regards, she does better than I do as far as just being disciplined. I don't think, I don't think she eats enough, but uh, I cook it, she eats it. And when she's had enough, she hands it back and says, I'm good. And uh, she's done terrific. She's really done great with it. My, my son, who our son, who is uh, 26, due to some circumstances, just had to move back in with us for a short period of time. And I've been shoveling meat at him. And I know that it's going to make a difference for a number of things in, in his life. Our daughter and uh, her, <laughs> our daughter is for it as far as working for us not interested really. She's a, she is a noodle girl and her husband is, he would, he is a meat eater. And I think they're doing a good job though, really of introducing our granddaughters to more and more meat based products. And it helps that we hunt on their land and provide a lot of venison. His family has sheep. So we've just started to incorporate that. So overall, it's been a positive experience for me, and I expect it'll get better as time goes on. Yeah, it's interesting. A lot of people will say that even for several years after initiating, they continue to get health benefits before they start to plateau. And that, I think that, I, honestly, I think from my perspective, I'm now in my eighth year of this, I felt better significantly. I kind of plateau, but I what I have noticed is I've actually gotten stronger, just physically stronger in my late 50s compared to where I was in my late forties and, and, and even early fifties. There's benefits as, as long as you continue to do the things that are beneficial. Mm-hmm. There is. So as far as 
I'll go back to the sort of the business you're in. People, do people notice? Do you talk about this at work or anything like that? I don't know how many people you, you yeah, work with. Yeah, actually, one of the coworkers subscribes to my YouTube channel and she and her family actually tried keto at the request of their teenage son. And unfortunately, and unfortunately it didn't work out for them, but I know it, it didn't work out largely because it was a lot of the keto foods that let's make this, let's make this taste like that. But I'm just, after some time, I really figured out that can be a slippery slope, a real rabbit hole for people. And so they ended up quitting because it gave them a lot of digestive problems. When you try to take, when you say, let's take these eggs and these ingredients and make a banana split, there's something's going to, something's going to give. And it, it just doesn't work that way. Uh, the, the carnivore diet is truly simple, even though it's not always easy for everyone. It is simple. And I think we complicate it just because of our past experiences and comfort foods and things that we've been used to over the course of our life. Yeah, I think when you're, like you said, you're slamming in all this erythritol and artificial sugars and you get bloated guts. And like you said, you're trying to, you're, like you said, you're, re- you're trying to recreate whatever it is, lasagna or pizza or desserts on a ketogenic diet. It, it does become, then what am I doing? And, and really with carnivore, you're like just retraining what you what you find it appealing to you. And I think that's something a lot of people struggle to make that transition. And once, because like for me, my, my diet is so damn boring. I eat <laughs> steak every day, basically. I, I like it. And it's like my dog. I, I literally feed my dogs the same thing every single day. And they're a hundred percent of the time, super excited to eat it because they're hungry. <laughs> and they, they're like, this is food and we like it. And I'm the same way. I'm just like, because I, I realize there are, tens of thousands of different foods out there that I could sample and try, but I honestly just not interested. Just not interested, which is, I think a lot of people can't conceive that because we've been brought up to have blue food and pink food and purple food and 75 flavors. And now we have Captain Crunch flavored maple syrup. And my God, it's just, when does it end? <laughs> and you know why I started focusing on the practical side, because there is a practical side to carnivore to keep it mixed up without going down a rabbit hole. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to make ground beef. There's different ways to cook steak. Sometimes we sous vide our steak before we pan fry it. Sometimes, thanks to you, by the way, I, I obtained an auto wild grill and yeah. we really enjoy using that. Sometimes we grill it on the grill. A lot of the things I do on, on my particular YouTube channel is here's a recipe, but I don't try to recreate things with the once in a while exception. It's, pretty much just the staple stuff. And then here's a different way to do the staple. Yeah. That that, that is something help because, you know, people ask me for recipes. I'm like, man, I just do the same damn thing over time. It's not very exciting. I can show you in like three minutes. And, but yeah, like sometimes not everybody has access to an Ottawa grill or a sous vide and there's different, there's it's much ways to skin a cat. So they say, there's a lot of ways you can cook a steak and make it taste pretty good. And so sometimes that's helpful. And there's other, sometimes you get big pieces of meat you don't know what to do with. And it's, yeah, I mean, you can take this, tough, chewy piece of meat and turn it into something tender and save a little money doing that. But yeah, there's there's some help for that, for sure. Do you, let me ask you about, because I always like to ask this, because I think this is an important part of the discussion, negatives that you've experienced on carnivore, practical carnivore, whatever you're saying. Are there, is there any significant negatives to your health or to, to anything at all since you've been doing this? I can't really think of any. It, I think there's just so many benefits. I can't really think of uh, anything that would be significant in the negative. And I'm not just talking about diet. For instance, everybody's concerned about the environment. If you want to really do something the environment for the environment, take up a carnivore way of eating and watch how much less trash you have in your trash can every week and boxes and plastic bags. And imagine getting in your car and not finding a four-year-old French fry stuck under the seat anymore that you don't have to clean up. The the impact, I think, is really far reaching beyond just I lost some weight and I feel great. Yeah, that is something. It's funny. I have uh, relatives that are vegetarian that they once in a while they come to stay with us. And when they bring all their own food because they like to bring their own food. And they, and they literally and my trash output the week they're there is tripled, quadrupled. It's amazing how much just packaged garbage and stuff is generated by that diet. Whereas I butcher paper, maybe there's a little plastic with those little 
I guess they call them styrofoam containers. They display meat in if you get it from the store, but it's, you're right. I literally, when it's just me eating, it's one fork, a cutting board and a knife and that's it. There's no dishes. There's no, it's so much more overall less impactful, at least from my end, from once, once it hits me. Do Let me you just one thing about the, the yeah. store-bought meat and the styrofoam mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. practical tip. If you take that meat out and get it off that little diaper that they put in there underneath the steak and put it in your own Ziploc bag, it'll last longer in the fridge if you need to keep it in the fridge for several days. Yeah, I know. Like, where, where if you have a vacuum sealer, even better, that'll last a lot longer too because there's no oxygen in there, or relatively little. But yeah, that's there's yeah, meat that I don't. I have no waste, and if there, if in the rare instance where I get a piece of meat where I just can't chew it, I, my dog will get it. I mean, it's just, mm -hmm. There's no waste in my house, and the dogs are both eating, you know, 100 percent carnivore diet anyway. So, they're we're all pretty happy here. When you say practical. What do you mean by that? What is your sort of definition of being practical carnivore? So there, there's, in my mind and in my life, there's doctrine and there's practice. There's, here's the right way to think and here's the right way to carry it out or the best way to carry it out. So when I say practical, let's get the facts. Let's learn what we need to learn. Let's learn how it works. And then once we know that and we're convinced of it, how do we apply that every day? Let's could be something as simple as meat management. I better get some meat out today or I'm going to be scrambling for something tomorrow. It can be making sure that here's a practical aspect that I actually did an entire video on, which was comparing the carnivore diet to the standard American diet cost wise. And I went to the grocery store and I just and I was very honest about these prices. And I went and I took a picture of every price of every food that I would have probably brought home if I was just eating a regular standard diet. And then I compared that to how to shop for meat and utilizing sales or coupons. And really it came out to be a wash and in some cases less expensive because of all the things that you're not buying. That's what I mean by practical. I like, like, for instance, sometimes I do videos about sausage making. I like sausages. Every sausage is just about you can buy in the grocery store has got sugar in it. It's usually about the second or third ingredient. And I found that most sausage recipes, if you don't put the sugar in it, you don't miss it at all. So it became not only a practical thing to make my own sausages, but it became a hobby and an interest. And so... That's what I mean when I say practical. What can I do about it? What can I do with this knowledge that I know is right? Yeah, I think you mentioned the simplicity of a carnivore diet because they just eat a bunch of meat to your full, right? That's effectively what we're telling people. However, that a lot of people, not you or I, not our, you or our generation in, in most cases, but we're getting to the point where you mean I have to cook something? That's mm. that, that for a lot of people, it's wait a minute. I've got to cook something that's, I can't just Uber eats or go to the restaurant or go to fast food or rip open a package of processed food. That's Trader Joe is your chef, right? Yeah. Or something like that. Yeah. I mean, exactly. Exactly. So we have this whole generation of people that are clueless when it comes to, to, to even preparing basic food. I can't remember. I remember prior to carnivore, honestly, I didn't cook that much. Cook some. I, mean, I had a wife that would cook more than I would, but you know, as far as being able to be proficient at making a steak, I've cooked so many damn steaks. I've, I've cooked literally almost 10,000 steaks in the eight years I've been doing this. So I'm, I'm, I, I can make a steak pretty well at this point. And I've got the tools to help me to do that as part of that. But you think about it, like a lot of people don't even know how to cook a steak, how to make, because a lot of people, and a lot of people like, and I love my mom. She's 80 years old. She was a horrible cook when I grew up. She was just, a lot of people harken back to their home cooking, their mom and love and all that. That wasn't me. My mom was like, my mom's tiny. I'm six foot five, 260 pounds. I'm a big guy. She's five foot one, about 105 pounds. Little bitty woman was like, it's weird how I came out of her, but I did. But anyway, it was just like, she was like food. To, she felt food was a waste of money. And I was like, what? <laughs> that doesn't make sense to me. I'm not, I disagree vehemently on this. But yeah, the fact that a lot of people just, and they figure it out. It's fun in my view. It's almost like cooking is almost a, an artwork in a way because it's just dialing it in, getting it perfect. Taking the, the extra time to me is a, 
It's a fun activity for me. I enjoy doing that. I don't know how you feel about that. You said you have these different ways to do that. You do the most, I guess you probably do most of the cooking at the house now. Is that fair to say? To, to my wife's delight, I have been doing the cooking in our house. We've been married 38 years. I've been doing the cooking for probably 36 and a half of it. And it's not that she's not capable, but she's just perfectly fine giving up that particular chore. Yeah, I don't mind cooking either. I do the same thing. And and I was less of a fan of doing the dishes. That's a good trade off. You cook, you, I'll cook, you throw the dishes away. I think part of it was I was traumatized as a 14 year old child when my first job was it was working as a dishwasher at a commercial restaurant. I was like the dishwasher kid. And it was gross because you get all this dried food food that people didn't know eat. It grossed me out a little bit. But anyway, let me ask you about you said that your doctor said, hey, keep doing what you're doing. Have you gone back recently? How long have you been in the, you once a year checkup? You'd mentioned statin. Let, let me go into that statins. Okay. You were on a statin for a period of time. What compelled you to do that? And why did you stop? I, I was on a statin for probably, I'm going to say probably in the neighborhood of 10 or 12 years. And it was, I had a doctor who was easy to get into and to see, but his mantra was better living through chemicals. And mm-hmm. so he was the one that really, he would say, okay, here's what your blood work says. Here's a pill. And that's where the statin started was with him. And I just continued to take them until I started to learn other things about LDL cholesterol. And I made the personal decision, which my doctor disagrees with. Um, I did go and have a, I, the last time I saw my doctor, I told her I was not going to take those anymore. And I said, let's focus on getting that. A1C down a little bit more. And I said, I will go and have a CAC test and then, then we'll regroup. And I was supposed to regroup three months after that. And honestly, I just, I haven't been back. It's, it's time. It's time that I go back and do that. Did you end up having the CAC score? I did. Is that ever done? Yeah. How did that, how did that go for you? 131. 131. Okay. Okay. So you did have some level of cardio, cardiovascular disease that had developed. And that was despite being on statins for how many years? 10 years or something yeah, like that? 10 or 12 years. Yeah. Despite yeah, that. And, and, and I know that's not from eating steak. That's mm-hmm. from the previous 57 years of what I've been eating. Certainly, that would stand a reason to assume so. Most people have not eaten a carnivore diet their whole life. That's just the way it is. And yet, yeah. a lot of people develop heart disease. And we try to blame saturated fat and steak. And the reality is, particularly when it comes to steak, it's only the average Americans eating two ounces of beef a day, which is two ounces. Is ounces. Two ounces would not get me across the room. It's not enough. That's, that's such a tiny amount, really. And so do you, let me ask you this question. You feel better. Obviously, it would appear that you feel better these days. Your quality of life is better. Is that Absolutely. fair to say, correct? If your risk for heart disease, because you're, you're, how old are you? You're like 60, 60. what did you say you were? So yeah, you're right in prime time age for heart disease. And this is when people get this stuff. And somebody might say, Hey, great. You feel better. You don't have your eczema. You lost some weight, but because your cholesterol is elevated, and I assume it might be, you are at higher risk for heart and cardiovascular disease. And what do you, how do you, do you say, no, I'm not. I disagree with that. Or do you say, even if I was, I prefer this quality of life? What do you, how do you, what's your calculation? Sort of a combination of of, uh, answers. One is, and I don't have the facts and figures in front of me, but I have explored them more than once. The on paper benefit uh, of longevity by taking statins for 20 or 30 years just doesn't seem to me to wash out to it being uh, beneficial is one. The second part is, yeah, I, I would rather I would rather do other things to improve my health, like exercise and eating right, making sure that there's lots of humor and laughter in my life, making sure that I have quality relationships with my family and with my kids. I would rather do those things and roll the dice than take a pill for the rest of my life and roll the dice. Mm -hmm. That's the answer. Yeah, there's plenty of people that die, drop dead of heart attacks that are on statins. That that clears. It's not a. It's not a. It's not a shield. That doesn't protect you. Know, I, you. I had a. I had a friend pass away this year, and he was one month shy of his hundred and first birthday, and he had a triple bypass in the eighties. Mm-hmm. And I looked, and he's he wasn't a carnivore or anything like that, but 
I just, I know that there's an element of rolling the dice along with, but let's not be stupid about it. <laughs> and my sister passed away a couple of years. She was only a couple yeah. of years ago. She was only 51. And um, yeah. I just really, I know that eating better would have helped her even as sick as she was. Yeah. Let me ask you this question. Why do you have a YouTube channel? What is it? What is Why did you decide to start that? What was carnivore curmudgeon? What, what yeah. was the purpose? Why did you feel compelled to do that? Two reasons. One was because it was easier for me to make recipes and certain foods and put it on video and not have to go find my recipe. I can just go to my YouTube channel and see what I did before. And the other one was I've always loved being able to help people. That's one of the reasons I'm in the funeral business because it's, it's a challenging job, but it really truly does help people if you do it right. And the, and the YouTube channel, I thought if I'm learning this, then it may help somebody else. And that's why, again, I focus on the practical stuff because I'm not a doctor. I'm not a scientist. I have to offer what I have to offer. And how has that channel been received from your perspective? Generally, pretty good feedback. You have people. I'm in, I guess, in enough of the public eye now where I get a lot of feedback. Some people think I'm the worst person in the world. Other people think you're, you're doing great. Have you had much of one or the other? I, I have not had much negative feedback at all, but I also don't have a whole lot of viewers. I think I've got like 1,800 subscribers or something in that neighborhood. Uh, and most of the people who watch, they'll just make a, a comment. I'll, I'm going to give this a try or that's a good idea or something like that. It's rare to get negative comments. And I really don't care uh, if I get negative comments because there's a jerk in every crowd. I see old sticks of stones type of thing. I just laugh. I think it's funny. I think I'm whatever. <laughs> I've had a lot worse things happen to me than somebody saying a bad comment about me. I could care less, quite honestly, but it's entertaining. It drives oh, engagement. Yeah, I made so, a yeah. YouTube video featuring you at one point. I made a oh, okay. uh, sort okay. of a parody YouTube video called the, the Carnivore High School. And you, by the way, you were the head coach. I think I do remember seeing something. Somebody sent me that that way. I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. I guess I could see that. I, I tend to like try to get after, get after people, get motivated to do stuff. What do you, so where do you plan to go with just continue putting out videos or do you have any, do you have any aspirational goals that now that you've, because obviously, I don't know, 10 years ago, your life was in a different trajectory, probably spiraling down, progressively getting sicker and sicker as so many people do. We see it so calmly and you see the very end point of that clearly with all the people that are, that are deceased, but has it given you any sort of different aspirations now that you like, hey, I feel really good now? And has it changed your life in that way? I think the one big aspiration is I want my 70s and my 80s to be better than my 50s were. And I believe that's entirely possible. And seeing other people as examples, there's so many young people that are just starting out on this or have been doing it for a while. I, I like to call them flat bellies when they spend they, they spend a lot of time in the gym and they're young and they're vibrant. And I think it's fantastic. And I learn from them. And that being said, will I ever be dancing in a store aisle? No, I, I won't be dancing in a store aisle. Will I ever be a flat belly? I don't know. I'll probably always be pear shaped. But if I can make my 70s and 80s and be around to see my grandkids grow up and to be a help to my kids, that's enough goal for me. And then as far as the YouTube video, it's a hobby. I, I enjoy it. I hope some people get some value out of it. Yeah, fair enough. We've got just a few minutes left. I want to just see, is there anything else we didn't discuss that you feel is written, something you want to share? Honestly, and I made some notes because I'm not always good about remembering everything I want to say. I think we pretty much covered it all. I, I appreciate your time and the venue to be able to talk to some people about this that are not just in my own personal sphere of influence. All right. So to find you, they would go to Carnivore Curmudgeon, right? The Carnivore Curmudgeon. <laughs> C-U-R-M-U-D-G-E-O-N, I believe. How do you spell curmudgeon? That's half I, one of the yeah. word is yeah. making people look it up and see what it means. Yeah, exactly. So I don't think you're a curmudgeon, but anyway. <laughs> you don't I, I'm not, unless I choose to be on certain topics. I'm an honorary right. curmudgeon. Yeah. All right. All right. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day. Appreciate you being here. Thank you, Dr. Baker.